Okay. And let's end the poll and see where we are. Well, as we can see, the vast majority of us are in the top half full drivers. Over 80% of us are in the top half and only 19% of us are in the bottom half full drivers. Now, if you think about it, how realistic is that? How likely is that, that we would all end up magically in the top half or not all of us, but four out of five of us would end up in the top half full drivers, right? It should be about 50-50, let's, let's be reasonable here. But whenever these I ask these questions at ASQ meetings, at PMI meetings, at all sorts of presentations I do, this is about the breakdown that I get. About 80% of the people end up in the top half and 20% are in the bottom half. It's even worse when these types of questions are asked of college students. So there was a study on college students that showed that two thirds, that 94% uh, of them believe themselves to be in the top half of all drivers and only 6% believe themselves to be in the bottom half of all drivers which is not great. I mean, if you think about college students, they have much less experience than, very, than all of you in driving, but that's what happens. So this is a tendency to be confident, be too confident in our decision-making. And this is overwhelmingly a problem that I see in decision-making in business, in reliability and quality, overconfidence in our skills. Just like we are overconfident in our driving skills, we tend to be overconfident in all other life areas as well. So it's our tendency to be way too confident. When people are 100% confident, in fact, research suggests that they're only right 80% of the time on average. That means that if you bet the farm, if you bet the company, you would lose the company, you would lose the farm one fifth of the time, and that's not great. <laughs> so this is especially important for people with more expertise, more experience, more authority. There was a study comparing doctors who were senior doctors and doctors who were junior doctors. So senior doctors, highly experienced doctors, of course, and junior doctors who are just out of medical school. And what the study found is that when you look at the senior doctors in the middle and, and the junior doctors, they were given a similar case study to evaluate of a sick patient and asked to prescribe a diagnosis. Well, the junior doctors and the senior doctors got the case study right at about the same rate. So they were right at about the same rate, but the senior doctors were much more confident in their decisions, which meant that the senior doctors were much less likely to order additional tests and see if you know maybe they were wrong, maybe they want to change their mind. So this is a problem, obviously. And this is called the overconfidence bias. And this is something for you to remember as something that causes us to make really bad decisions about the future. So thinking about future proofing, this is a big, big problem for us in future proofing, making decisions about the future. The bigger tendency here is the intuition, the idea that we should go with our gut. We are comfortable going with our gut. We're comfortable trusting our intuitions. This is who we are as human beings. You know, we have gurus like Tony Robbins telling us to go with your gut, be, trust your intuition, follow your heart. Tony Robbins says, be primal, be savage, or Malcolm Gladwell tells us to blink, make your decisions in the blink of an eye and trust your intuition. The thing is, trusting your intuition, trusting your gut feels really comfortable. It feels really good. It feels right. It feels intuitive. Not trusting your gut by definition is counterintuitive, but it often leads us to make disastrous decisions. For example, by being way too confident and not thinking about all the consequences of making a decision and addressing these problems in advance. So this is a big problem for us. And it stems from the fact that our intuitions are not really evolved for the modern environment. Our gut reactions, our intuitions, they're a good fit for the savanna environment. They are not a good fit for the, for the modern world, which is much more complex. And in the savanna environment, we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. So we had to be very tribal. And in the modern environment, we did not, don't have to be very tribal. We live in a complex, multipolar, global world. In the savanna environment, if we weren't sufficiently tribal, well, we'd be kicked out of our tribe. 
if we weren't sufficiently loyal to our tribe, and then we die. And if we weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, well, they take us over, and then we die as well. We're the descendants of those who didn't die. Similarly, thinking about the fight or flight reflex, we had to rely on the fight or flight reflex to survive. You might have also heard of it as the saber tooth tiger reflex, where it was better to it better to jump at a hundred shadows than to miss one saber tooth tiger. Well, in the modern environment, that's a really bad idea. Jumping at a hundred shadows will get way overstressed. We make impulsive decisions. We come to snap judgments, and we are overconfident. In the savannah environment, it was very important for us to be overconfident. If we weren't sufficiently overconfident, if we weren't overconfident, we wouldn't jump at a hundred shadows. And then we'd miss that one saber tooth tiger, and then we'd die. It was much more dangerous to miss the one saber tooth tiger. In the modern world, jumping at a hundred shadows, at a hundred emails, at a hundred notifications is a really bad idea. That's a big problem for us. That's not something you want to do in the modern world. We have many less saber tooth tiger situations in the modern world, but we still jump to conclusions. We're still very impulsive. Our intuitions are calling us to make bad decisions. So that's a danger of going with your gut. And the broader tendency that we want to address here is called cognitive biases. These are the dangerous judgment errors that cognitive science scholars and behavioral science scholars like myself research and help us address. And they come from a combination of our evolutionary backgrounds, as I mentioned, and as a result of how our brains are wired. So that's the combination of what's going on here. Our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired are causing us to make bad mistakes called dangerous, and these are the dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. Now, let's talk about another one that I want you to be really aware of. So this is one of the biggest challenges that I've seen for risk and reliability and quality professionals to make good decisions. And it's called the planning fallacy. The planning fallacy. You've probably heard the phrase that failing to plan is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Now, that phrase, of course, indicates that, well, you make a plan, things will go well. And that's a problem because research shows that when we make a plan intuitively, we feel that things will go according to plan. And we don't put in enough contingencies, not nearly enough threats. So we assume that the future will go according to plan and it, we underestimate risks and problems. So a much better phrase that I teach in my trainings, I teach my clients is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. Failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. That's a much, much more effective and accurate phrase. So we underestimate resources of time, money, information, social capital, all other resources that we need to make good decisions. And this is a big problem for us. This is a planning fallacy that I really want you to be aware of. So we already talked about the overconfidence bias and planning fallacy. Those are two big, big problems that cause us a lot of stress and harm when we're trying to make good decisions about the future, so the future proofing, which is what we want to address. Now, that's some of the examples of problems. Let's talk a little bit about how to get more knowledge of these problems, of these cognitive biases, before moving on to one type of solution that you can apply. So there's an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace that you can use to get a lot more information about the problems, identify which ones are the most problematic for you, and figure out the next steps to address these problems for your organization. So this assessment focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings and helps evaluate their extent and impact in your workplace and gives you the next steps for addressing them. So that's what the assessment is about. Now, let me show you the assessment and I'll want you to turn to open up your chat window. We'll be using the chat window for this part of the presentation. So make sure to open up that chat window. All right, you should all be seeing the assessment right now on your screen. So it's shared, you should all be seeing it. 
So let's go through it. Description, so directions. Each question refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. Your goal is to indicate how often this problem occurred in your workplace in the past year. So that's what we'll be answering right now. The answer for each question should be in percentage terms out of all the possible times the problem might have occurred. So if you're doing the specific the assessment with a specific organizational department, team or group, apply your evaluation only to that unit. So think about your specific unit, your specific team, what's going on there, and don't overthink it. Generally, your initial impression is going to be correct. How I use this assessment is, this is great for a team to use to evaluate these cognitive biases in the team. I use it with clients by doing an initial needs analysis, looking at what kind of problems, cognitive biases are the worst for them, and what next steps can we take to address them. So again, there's going to be 30 questions. You don't have to know anything about the cognitive biases to answer these questions, and you'll see what I mean in a sec. So let's talk about, let's look at the first one of these questions. Percentage of projects that missed the deadline or went over budget. So number one. So think about it. What percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget in your team, in your unit, in your organization, whatever size it is, whatever is most encompassing for you? Please go ahead and chat percentage of what missed the budget or went over the deadline. So we have... Uh, 80%, 15%, 20%. So make sure to chat to everyone, not directly to me. 45%, 20%, 0%, 80%, 60%, 10%, 25%, 80%, 80%, 80%. Good, keep chatting. So this is, of course, has to do with the planning fallacy. When you have a number of projects, miss the deadline or go over budget, that is the planning fallacy, that we tend to make plans and then we don't stick to those plans because we overestimate the success of these plans. We underestimate the kind of threats, the kind of problems that might have occurred. So this is called the planning fallacy. And for any of these questions, if you're in the five to 10% range, it's not a big deal. It's natural variance, it happens. If it's in the 10 to 20% range, that becomes a little bit of an issue. If it's in the 20 to 30% range, it's a moderate issue. If you have anything 30% and above, that becomes more of a serious issue because of course you're misdirecting resources and not putting the resources where they need to be put in. Now, let's get to another one. Let's do number three. So number three, of all significant decisions, in what percentage of cases was someone overconfident about the decision? So think about the last year. When you were, as a team, making a decision, someone in your team was overconfident about the decision, at least one person. How often did that occur, of all significant decisions? Please go ahead and chat. 10%, 5%, 15%. Ten percent, forty percent, ten percent, ten percent, ten percent, good, fifty percent, thirty percent. It's a little bit lower than the planning fallacy. So, but still, some folks with thirty uh, percent and above, twenty, thirty percent and above, that's definitely something to be aware of. That overconfidence can be definitely an issue. So, this is the overconfidence bias, and this is something that's definitely one to be thinking about addressing. Let's take a look at another one that can be a bad problem. Percentage of team conflicts that occurred because someone overestimated the effectiveness of their communication skills and persuasiveness. So number two, question two. So please go ahead. Think about all the team conflicts and think about why they occurred. When, how, what percentage occurred because someone overestimated how effective they are communicating and persuading? 
So let's see, see another 10%, 20%. Mm -hmm. So this is a so this is not as much of a problem, great, for most people. This is called the illusion of transparency. So illusion of transparency is when we tend to believe that our that our messages, what we're telling others, what we're communicating to others, is transparent, and that they can truly understand what we're saying, and they're getting the message that we're saying, and that we're effective in communication and communicating and persuading them. Of course, that's far from always the case, and that results in a lot of team conflicts. Let's talk about number five. Of all situations when individual or team had to deal with difficult, uncomfortable issues, when they chose to focus on trivial issues instead. So if in a meeting, let's say, and there are some serious issues to deal with, then trivial issues take up an inordinate amount of time compared to when compared to the amount of time dedicated to serious issues. 10%, 0%, mm -hmm. 15%, 20%, 25%, 20%, 25%. It seems to not be too much of an issue. 30%, 30%. Mm -hmm. So this is a cognitive bias called the Parkinson's law of triviality and also called bike shedding. So named for a team that was designing a nuclear plant and spent way too much time designing a bike shed next to the nuclear plant. So that's an example. Uh, let's go with number four. Of all situations when someone had evidence that would contradict their beliefs, or information that would disprove how they interpret the situation, in what percentage of the cases did they ignore the evidence or misinterpret the information? So please go ahead. Yeah, I, are, uh, I will send you the survey to everyone after the presentation. So you'll get, you'll get a copy of the survey. 15%, 10%, 50%, 10%, 20%. says 20%. 20%, 20%, mm -hmm. 70%. Mm -hmm. So this obviously is a range. This is called the confirmation bias, where we tend to look for evidence that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. It's often a serious problem for reliability professionals, especially when they're dealing with non-reliability professionals. And so this is called the confirmation bias. Let's do one more. So you see the flavor. This is one is going to be a little bit more in the tribalism spectrum of things. Number six, when a potential or current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? See, 20%, 25%, 25%, 20%, 20%. Twenty-five percent, fifteen percent, sixty percent, thirty percent. So this 25%, 30%, this has to this is about a cognitive bias called the halo effect. The halo effect. When we have a positive impression of someone because of some characteristics that they have or something that they did that we liked, then we tend to view their whole contribution the too positively compared to what it actually should be. So when you're seeing people evaluated too positively, that tends to be the halo effect. All right. And again, like I said, it'll be sent to folks after the presentation, uh, the assessment. Now, let's talk about a couple more techniques to address these problems. Five questions to avoid decision disasters. So we talked about knowledge, knowing about these problems. That's the assessment. Now let's talk about how to address them. So five questions to avoid decision disasters is a great technique to use 
for any decision in the moment, you don't want to screw up. It only takes a couple of minutes to apply. So there's you know, five to 10 decisions a day to which you can apply this from. Sending an email to someone that you don't want to screw up to making a decision about a purchase or making a decision about who's going to participate in some meeting, any sort of decision, how to list something on your quality management software, decisions that you want to do to avoid disasters. Five questions to avoid decision disasters. So these questions are meant to address a number of cognitive biases at once, and they're very effective to be used by you as an individual for your decisions or as a team decision-making technique where you get the whole team together and you go through all the questions together as an agenda. So let's go for the questions one by one. First, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence didn't you take into account? This question relates to the confirmation bias and a number of other cognitive biases where we tend to not look for information that goes against our beliefs, that goes against our intuitions. So you wanna look at twice as hard at information that goes against your beliefs and intuitions in order to make the right decisions. Next, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? And we talked about a number of them, especially looking at the future, you wanna think about the overconfidence bias, the planning fallacy, we saw the planning fallacy tended to be a pretty serious issue for many folks from the, from the questionnaire that was asked from the assessment and the responses in the chat. So you want to be thinking about what's going on. If you're making a decision about a person, the halo effect might be at play. And once you take a look at the assessment, you go through it, you will learn about these cognitive biases. And so you'll be able to quickly answer this question. Third. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about that angel on your shoulder. What would they suggest you do? Think about what you would tell a friend in this situation. Think about this persona and get that external perspective. We get about 50% of the benefit just by thinking about the external perspective from this question. That's what the research suggests. And we get the other 50% of the benefit by calling this person, reaching out to this person, emailing them. Okay, so we, the first three questions are about focusing on the decision itself. The last two questions are about implementing it. Because even if you make the right decision, if you don't implement it well, you will not have a great outcome. So how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about this decision and think about the failure modes. If you're sending an email, why might the other person ignore, ignore it, not listen to it, not do what you want? If you are about to present something in the meeting, why might that presentation go awry or anything like that that you want to be thinking about? How can this decision fail? Finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? Now, after we make a decision, we tend to be stuck to it, like those more senior doctors. They tend to be fixed to the decision. It's much easier for us to change our mind if we can say in advance what new information would cause us to revisit this decision. So let's say if the person you're emailing doesn't respond within three days, then you make a commitment to call this person or something like that. So look at the new information and decide what new information would cause you to revisit this decision. Again, this is, all, this is great to do individually, but also very helpful to do as a team when you just go as a team through all of these questions and you have everyone answer these questions by themselves before a team meeting and then come to the team meeting then start the team meeting by reading these their answers to the questions and then discussing them in turn. And you'll find that you'll save a lot of time on decisions and you'll be much more confident in the quality of your decisions and you'll make many, the, your, the decisions you make will be much better. So this is five questions to avoid decision disasters. And finally, a broader technique for failure proofing projects. How do you prevent project failure? This is really important, of course, for you to prevent project failure. Let's go through these steps. So this is for more major projects. This will take a while to do. So, I mean, at the smaller projects, this will take a, an hour to do or so. Larger projects, it will take more. So there's gonna be eight steps and I'll go through all of them. 
to gather relevant stakeholders, explain the process, develop next best alternatives, brainstorm reasons for failure, decide on the most likely problems, brainstorm how to fix problems, do the same for successes, and revise the plan. Let's go for them one by one. First, gather relevant stakeholders. Six to 10 people is a good number. You definitely don't want more than 10 because it gets way overwhelming <laughs> with all the people too much. So gather leaders with the most expertise, not just higher up personnel. And that means people who can make and implement decisions as well as people who have expertise on the matter at hand. I strongly encourage you to think about using an independent facilitator from outside the team so that all the team members, including the team leader, can participate in the decision as opposed to also facilitating the activity. Next, explain the process. So you want everyone to be familiar and comfortable with the process so that all the participants are on the same page about what they will be doing. Next, develop two next best alternatives, NBAs. Next best alternative means that after you have an initial plan, right, you have an initial plan, and then you want to develop some next best alternatives to your initial plan. So you have an initial plan, what would you do if your initial plan, if you couldn't do your initial plan? So have each participant write down an NBA anonymously. Anonym anonymity is very valuable because it allows people to write down some unpopular opinions. So this is definitely important to do. The facilitator gathers and reads everyone's NBA. Then you hold a vote to select the top two NBAs and facilitate the discussion. And then take an anonymous vote of whether one of the NBAs is preferable to the original plan or whether you want to integrate some elements of these NBAs into your original plan. All right, let's go on to step four. Reasons for failure. So thinking about why this might fail. This is an uncomfortable question. So this is really important for you to do well. Assume that your initial plan failed. So have that assumption that your initial plan went awry. It failed for some reason that you don't know. So imagine that it's been a year after you implement this project, which you know you thought everything would go well, everything would go according to plan, but it failed pretty clearly. Everyone acknowledges it failed. Now work backward. Generate all the reasons for why it failed. Brainstorm these reasons. It's very important to not say, well, why might it fail? That's not the way that you approach this. You have to assume it failed because otherwise we have a psychological tendency that inhibits us from brainstorming reasons for failure. Now, if you do what I suggest and say it definitely failed, let's figure out why it failed, that helps us brainstorm reasons effectively for failure. Each participant writes down at least three plausible reasons for failure, so three plausible reasons, and the facilitator gathers everyone's statements, highlights the key themes, and then focuses on politically problematic reasons, things that wouldn't come up. For example, oh, I was doing this, I was an independent facilitator for this, uh, for a failure proofing technique for a new product launch. And one of the reasons for failure that was anonymous was that the product launch would fail because the head of marketing and head of operations are at each other's throats all the time. <laughs> so that's, not a that's a politically problematic thing to say, right? But now it was on the table and we were able to get at that and fix the problem because it was now on the table. Now, think about the most likely problems, which are the ones that are most likely and most impactful, especially politically problematic ones. And check for potential cognitive biases. So you already know the assessment, you can use that to do so. Assess anonymously the likelihood of each reason for failure using percentages. That's really helpful to get specificity and pay special attention to the ones that are most harmful, which means the combination of the most damaging times the most probable. So most likely, most damaging, most harmful problems, especially ones that are politically problematic to discuss. And then brainstorm how to fix problems, to think about the failures that are most relevant and what you can do to solve these problems in advance and address these cognitive biases, as I mentioned, again, using the assessment. Next, 
you're going to do the same thing for success. So failure proofing is not only preventing failure, but also maximizing success. So brainstorm ways to bring about success. Imagine that the decision succeeded spectacularly and brainstorm ways that you can achieve this outcome. So again, write out three plausible reasons for success. The facilitator then gathers everyone's statements, highlights key themes, leads a discussion, including checking for cognitive biases, and then you brainstorm ways of maximizing each reason for success. And finally, you revise the plan. So revise the overall plan based on this strategic exercise, and if needed, you repeat the exercise. And that's the failure proofing technique. All right, everyone. So let's talk about, let's right now break out into breakout groups. And let's see. So what I'll do is I'll create breakout rooms and you will have five minutes to discuss with each other what are your, which of these, techniques would you be most able to adapt to your needs and how can you effectively bring them within your organization so that's going to be the topic of the discussion you'll see that there will be a breakout room created and that you will be able to join these breakout rooms in five minutes there will be a timer in four minutes in four minutes there will be a timer that says 60 seconds to countdown that means that you still have 60 seconds to discuss, but that you want to start wrapping up. All right, I'm gonna open up the rooms. Please go ahead, you will click on join room and then you will go ahead and join it.
Okay, good. I think everyone should be back, which is great. Let's go through the concluding conclusion, uh, the key takeaways uh, before we get to our discussion. So the key takeaways that you wanna be thinking about. You want to be aware that the planning fallacy and overconfidence bias, as well as other cognitive biases, seriously undermine our future-proofing abilities. Five questions to avoid decision disasters helps us future-proof on daily decision-making, and that failure-proofing is the best practice debiasing technique that helps us future-proof a variety of projects, decisions, and plans that are more major and serious. And the additional resources that I promised, I'll send you the assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, a decision aid on five key questions to avoid decision disasters, a manual on defending your future, and sample chapters from a bestseller on this topic, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions to Avoid Business Disasters. And I'll be happy to give a coaching session to the first three people who request one. So what you'll get is an email with a link to schedule a coaching session. And if you click on it, and if you're able to schedule it, then it's still open. All right, and you will see another poll of whether you would like to get the trainer's resources by email. And at this stage, I will be happy to take questions and to hear what your takeaways were from the discussion. So both of those I'd be happy to have. Please go ahead. You can unmute yourself, you can use the chat, whatever is most comfortable for you. Linda, yes, you'll receive a copy of the presentation. So Melissa says that her group focused on discussing the importance of key stakeholders and ensuring that they're informed and involved. Definitely, that's that's very valuable. And it's hard to do because of this illusion of transparency, where that cognitive bias that I mentioned, where we tend to think that everyone is, that it's transparent to others, what we're thinking and what we're planning. And it's not really. And that's one of the ways of illusion of transparency, where key stakeholders are not informed and involved when we actually, when we think they are. So Bart asks, how would you differentiate future chip proofing from typical risk management? Typical risk management is about what's going on now, is about the current situation. And it doesn't really look into the changing dynamics that might occur in the future. So how might, thinking about how might things fail in the future is a different dynamic because then you're thinking about how can things change and how are things going to be disrupted? That's one dynamic. Another dynamic is that future proofing does involve awareness of behavioral science and cognitive science. So how are our brains going to cause us to make mistakes about the future? We tend to greatly underestimate the way that the future changes. We tend to think that the future will be much like the past. That's one of the mistakes. We tend to be overconfident about it. We tend to fall into planning fallacy. So being aware of all of these things is how you make sure that it's not simply risk management, the traditional risk management as it's practiced, but future proofing where you are aware of the future and the way that our brain screws up when we make assessments of the future. Ah, Joe, Ellen Scott asks a very important question. How do you get participants to break through their own comfortable thinking patterns and engage their discomfort? Well, the assessment is a really good technique. So the research shows that the key to helping people break through these patterns is to show that they, their teams, they make these mistakes and that these mistakes are costly, but they cost them, that they're damaging to them individually. They're damaging to them as a team. So helping them see through the, using the assessment that, hey, this is a problem and this is something I should actually be addressing, that is a really good way of taking the steps to address these, to break through their discomfort 
and well, to break through their comfortable thinking patterns and help them engage the discomfort. Michael says also focused on getting all stakeholders involved, definitely. And assessment is a good way to do that. Yes, so Adiola asks that they're close to an FMEA only for persons and personality thoughts. Sure, yes, so with reliability professionals, quality professionals, it tends to, focus tends to be on the project and not nearly enough on the people. But the people, these cognitive biases, that's the behavioral science of things. That's, that's what tends to be missing in, that's, you know, that's why I'm speaking to you right now. That's what tends to be missing in reliability and quality management and risk management, looking at the people, the mistakes that they tend to make, that we tend to make, the way that we are irrational and emotional. And in quarter, we need to incorporate that into traditional risk management, reliability assessments, quality management. Okay. Michael says also thinking of FMA and the FTA. Yes, that gets overlooked often. Yep. And so this is a sign, this is the science of people, behavioral science, right? Cognitive science. And it does get overlooked. And this is what we want to not overlook because overlooking them causes us to make a lot of mistakes. Any other questions? Okay, great, no questions. Wonderful, David, do you want to close us up or shall I? Well, I'll close this. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the ASQ Risk and Reliability Division and also on behalf of our audience today for such a great presentation. Hope you come back and do another one in the future. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We'll be glad to come back and do another one. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Thomas. Glad it's helpful. Thank you, Bart. It was great. You're welcome, Jacqueline. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.